in the summer of 1875, Texans elected 75 Democrats and 15 Republicans, six of whom were African American. And they sent them as delegates to a constitutional convention. And now 83 attended the gathering in Austin. Uh, majority actually were not native Texans and more than 40% were members of the Texas Grange, which is an agricultural union. And the farmers wanted strict economy and government, otherwise they would lose their property, they felt like they did under Governor Davis. So the slogan was retrenchment and reform. That was a major goal. So we're gonna reduce government, basically. They didn't even hire somebody to transcribe their discussions or allow publication of any of their proceedings. They just wanted a final product. So there's never been any official record of the convention that gave Texas its most enduring constitution. And their zeal was to strike down all the Davis stuff. In fact, they inserted a statement, no law shall ever be enacted requiring a registration of voters in the state. Now that since has changed. So they began to dismantle the machinery of the Davis administration and restrict the powers of the three branches of government. Legislature with every other year sessions, limited salary power, the judiciary would be elected Justice of the Peace, county courts, all of them would be popularly elected. We still have that today. We don't have a governor who nominates and then the Senate confirms all these justices. And they inserted specific policy provisions. They reinstated segregated public education. Uh, they repealed compulsory school attendance. And they allowed only taxpayers to vote on local bond issues. And it was put to a popular vote and it won by a more than two to one majority. The largest cities voted against it, but the overall 85% rural population voted for it. And it best expressed the distrust of government uh, during the Civil War really and the Reconstruction period from that 1861 to 1875 period. There was a hostility towards government and they took out their vengeance on government really and government control. So they placed many restrictions on the state's fundamental law. Here's the governor just before the convention and really the focus of a lot of the ire of the convention pictured on the right, all the members. Sat down for photographs, but it still is the constitution of the state of Texas and took place at the old Capitol here, which would burn down about uh, five years later. And the current one would be built. Now, compared to other constitutions, we have the longest in terms of words and the second number of amendments, 484 as of 2017. But it is still used today. It is a long constitution. The US Constitution has only 4,400 words and 27 amendments.
But again, there's a lot of restraining power, empowering the voters. And there's a lot of, a lot of detail. A lot of stuff r relates to public finance. Unfortunately, many people don't bother to vote in these constitutional amendment elections. Most things could be resolved by legislative statutes. Recently in 05, the Proposition 2, which signified a new direction in the substantive nature of constitutional amendments was on the ballot. So occasionally you'll get one like Proposition 2. Now this one was controversial because it sought to ban same-sex marriages and it did win overwhelming support among voters, 76% supporting it, 24% opposing. Many times these propositions will impact colleges and universities. But as you can see on the table on page 63 in your text, there's been one to 13 propositions proposed and as many as 22 in 2003, seven in 2015. Vote. Our Texas state constitution is a bloated, confusing document with nearly 500 amendments. Compare that to the U.S. Constitution, which has only been amended 17 times since it was adopted. Texas's amendments cover everything from who gets taxed for what to whether or not a baseball team can sell raffle tickets. Some of them seem pretty arbitrary. Why couldn't the legislature deal with this in session? Why isn't this just in the tax code? Why is a one-time only bond vote included in our founding document? Some amendments directly violate the US Constitution and others are so vitally important that it's shocking that the original writers didn't think to include them in the first place. How did it get this way? Well, we have to go back to 1845 when Texas joined the Union. Our first constitution was pretty similar to the US version, short, sweet, and broad enough to allow government to do its job. It was a pretty good constitution. But with the Civil War and then Reconstruction, all that got thrown out the window. During the 1860s, Texas went through three constitutions. By 1869, Texas was under military rule by the federal government. Texas adopted a new constitution that year, but it only passed because Confederate sympathizers were barred from voting. That same year, Edmund J. Davis, a Republican, won the governor's race, barely, and began putting Texas back together in ways many Texans weren't happy with. Then, after a controversial election, Davis lost in 1873, but he contested the results and refused to give up the governorship. Democrats were not having it. They climbed ladders to the second floor of the Capitol building and barricaded themselves inside. Davis brought in state troops to occupy the first floor. Eventually, Davis gave up, but when he left, he locked his office door. The Democrats had to break it down with an ax. The next Republican governor wouldn't be elected for over 100 years. In 1876, Texans approved a new constitution, the one we still use today. It was a direct reaction to Reconstruction, an overbearing federal government, and Davis's Republican rule. It outlined a very limited government with a weak executive branch. The Attorney General, Land Commissioner, and others are all directly elected rather than appointed by the governor. The judicial branch was divided in two criminal and civil, and judges are elected as well. But the writers were so focused on preventing the kind of government control they had suffered in the past that some of their provisions, like the legislature that only meets once every two years, make more sense in the 19th century than they do in the 21st. And rules that are so constricting don't leave much wiggle room for actual governing. This means we need a lot of amendments. 
On the one hand, that can be a good thing. Citizens get to participate in a more direct democracy. On the other hand, we often have to vote on trivial stuff that should be handled by our elected officials. Or the legislature passes the buck onto us to decide controversial issues. Take one of my favorite proposed amendments, SJR 7 from 1919. On the surface, it's your standard women's suffrage vote, but this one was a double-edged sword. While it would have granted women the right to vote, it also would have taken away the vote for another group, non-citizens. That's right. There was a time in Texas when non-citizen men could vote, but not citizen ladies. Not surprisingly, that measure failed, but most don't. Out of 673 proposed amendments, over 70% have passed. Yet every two years, our constitutional elections have abysmally low turnout, sometimes less than 10%. Texas already has a low turnout rate in general, but without a big name on the ticket to lure us to the polls, most of us don't participate. But even if we're not voting for a person on the ballot, these amendments are proposed by our elected officials and voting for or against their policies holds them accountable for their actions. It says, we're here, we're paying attention and we show up to vote. See you on election day. So what is the amendment process? Let's go over that. <clears throat> Every state has some way to change their constitution, which outlines the powers and function of government. Now, what, what are the methods? Well, you can have the courts come in and alter by interpretation the wording of the document. But the main method is through formal amendment. Now, that's the chief method by which we can change our Constitution. Like she said, registered voters have an opportunity to vote on an, a proposed amendment, constitutional amendment election, every two years, and even sometimes every year, an understanding of the steps can help you. But it is important. In Article 17, Section 1, there is a relatively simple procedure outlined here on your screen. First, there's a joint resolution proposing an amendment. It's introduced in the House or the Senate during a regular session called by the governor, or during a special session called by the governor. Now, two thirds of each chamber must adopt the resolution. Then the Secretary of State just prepares the paperwork, describes it, and the Attorney General approves the statement. Then the explanatory statement is published twice in a Texas newspaper that prints official state notices and a copy is posted in each county courthouse at least 30 days before the election. And the voters, this is the second big one, the voters must approve only by a simple majority in a regular or special election. Now the governor has no veto power in the process. And once it's passed, he would proclaim the amendment. Now, as she said, there's low voter turnout. 12% is probably the maximum. There's no statewide official, no federal official, so it doesn't excite too many people, except with the exception of the 2003 same-sex marriage amendment. Now, some states allow voters to put an amendment or a law onto the ballot. This is called an initiative. An initiative at the state level, though, does not exist in Texas. Now, some cities have it, as we saw in Chapter 3. Like in Houston a few years ago, they voted on no men in women's restrooms in the city of Houston. A couple of days ago, we talked about how the Obama administration was suing a school in Idaho over this transgender 
restroom facility issue. Essentially, there was a male student who identified as a female, and when I say male, he had the anatomy of a male. He identified as a female, and the Obama administration said it would be discrimination for the school to not allow that male, physically male student, to go into the female or a girl's restroom or locker room if he identifies as a female. Confusing, I know. Well, the city of Houston today overwhelmingly voted down Proposition 1, which it would have essentially done the exact same thing for the entire city of Houston in the state of Texas. This is a huge deal. The nut mayor, Anise Parker, and the city of council tried to pass this ordinance about a year ago. This law was challenged repeatedly, was taken up to the Texas Supreme Court, and the Texas Supreme Court said, look, you can either drop the law, the ordinance, or you can put it on the ballot in the next election cycle and put it to the test of the voters of Houston. Well, the city of Houston turned out in droves, much bigger voter turnout than even the past mayoral election in Houston. This tells you that this has struck a chord with people in the city of Houston. But I'm here to tell you that it's a it's a hugely positive thing, not just for the city of Houston, but for us in this fight for liberty. Because this says to me that people are totally not asleep. They have come out a little bit out of the trance. It's just now getting to the point, it's just now getting crazy enough with the things that are being that are trying to be passed where people are beginning to say, you know what, I'm gonna get up off the couch and I'm gonna do something about this. And it doesn't just get fixed with voting, it, fixed with, it gets fixed with where we spend our dollars, it gets fixed with lots of different things. What? So, in that case, the voters in Texas but specifically Houston, did use the power of the initiative allowed under the Constitution and put it on the ballot and it did pass that you could not have uh, anatomic, anatomically men go into women's restrooms. Now that could change in a future election. That's up to the local voters. Uh, Laredo, we have our own local propositions, but these were at the suggestion of the the council. There's one about the mayor uh, wanting more veto power. We'll see what happens on that one. Now, as soon as it was adopted in 1876, there have been attempts to revise the Constitution uh, some resolutions calling for a constitutional revision convention were introduced as early as 1887, uh, about 11 years after it was adopted. Now, in the 60s, there began a, a movement to change the entire constitution, remove obsolete constitutional provisions, and many were beginning in the 1960s. Now there was a comprehensive movement led in the late 60s after this success and early 70s called the Constitutional Revision Commission. And among other things, they produced that film that we saw the first part of in part one of the lecture. So let's take a look at that, catch you up on that uh, attempt, and he'll discuss some of the current changes in the, what the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate and the Governor and the Lieutenant Governor, all they think, what they think about the constitutional revision. So this film was produced in the early 1970s to try to convince people how to, how to vote, or at least how to think about the proposed constitutional revision. That is the key to understand <coughs> the proposed constitution. The 
people of Texas in 1876 did not want any single government official to have any real authority. Their last governor had had virtual dictatorial powers. He was also empowered to appoint more than 8,000 state, county, and local officials, including all judges. The people responded by splitting up the executive branch into seven different offices but none have any real authority to take action. Few governments anywhere, national or state, have so weak a central authority as Texas. Well, we need a complete reorganization of the executive branch. It's almost not too much to say we need the creation of an executive branch. We really don't have an executive branch under our present setup. The usual functions that one associates with an executive branch, education, welfare, regulation of industry are handled uh, by separately elected and appointed boards. But we need uh, an executive branch along the federal model. We need our hundreds of state agencies uh, reorganized into 14 or 15 topical departments of state go government, each headed by a secretary, appointed by the governor, confirmed by the Senate. Only in that way will we ever have a truly responsive state government. In a sense, we do have a cabinet form of government in the governor's office because as governor, you have the authority to select the heads of the different divisions in the governor's office, such as your legal division, such as your Department of Community Affairs, and such as your Compre health, comprehensive health programs. I suppose there's six or eight heads within the governor's office. And then there's something else to think about. Under our present system, the governor has the authority subject to confirmation. You know, this is the governor at the time, Preston Smith. Of the Senate. Of making all of the appointments uh, to the board, commissions, agencies, and authorities, such boards as the University of Texas Board of Regents, the Texas a and University Board, and all of these different boards that have been created by the legislature. And when the legislature created these commissions, agencies, authorities, and boards, they were given certain, certain authority under the legislature, by the legislature, to control whatever area that their commission uh, uh, pertained to. Well, in reality, these boards, these commissions, these agencies, these authorities, they are your state government. And these appointments are made by the governor. But once those appointments are made and confirmed, then the governor no longer has any influence whatsoever with those appointees. The boards and agencies can do anything they please, and the governor's office uh, has no authority over them, not even in a budgetary sense. Many of the judges in the state of Texas feel that their jobs have been hampered by the extreme restrictions placed on them by the writers of the Constitution. For many years, the highest judicial authority in Texas was the Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court, Robert Calvert. Two years ago, some of us undertook uh, to make some uh, reforms in the judiciary, and in nearly every instance we found we were confronted with a constitutional prohibition against those reforms. Our thought had been uh, to completely revise the entire judiciary article, uh, starting at the bottom or the top, whichever you wish. Uh, starting at the bottom, for example, let us uh, set up a, an administration of justice in all of the courts at a lower level, justice courts, municipal courts, county courts, county courts in law, so that these cases are brought to trial and disposed of. And district courts, let us do the same thing. And then let us speed up the appellate process to get them disposed of on appeal. Uh, we think revising the entire judicial section of the Constitution and particularly to provide for central administration of the system is the best way to speed up justice. Take you two years to get a trial of a jury case in some of the metropolitan cities of this state, and that's just much, much too long. That amounts to a denial of justice when you can't get uh, speedy justice. The writers of the present Constitution did not restrict the legislature as much as other branches of government in fact, reacting against the dictatorial governor of Reconstruction days, they placed more authority than usual in the hands of the people's elected representatives. Yet even here, there are those who see a need for change. In the legislative branch, uh, we have a clear need for annual sessions. As a matter of fact, uh, in 
in the past uh, few years, we have really come to uh, budgeting on an annual basis, which is the only sound way to do it. And with, it's costing us millions of dollars a year, I would really to try to budget on a biannual basis. Annual sessions is the main thing that, that we need. I have never favored annual sessions. Now, I would favor more authority, especially budgetary authority, for the governor. But I think the uh, fact that the governor has the right to call a special session completely destroys any need, whatever, or any basis of need for annual session. Of course, the trouble with a special session is, if it is indeed it is a trouble, is that it can consider only the matters that the governor submits. I think the legislature really ought to have uh, uh, more, uh, more freedom than that, more time to do its business. Despite the unusual dominance of the legislature and the Texas governmental system, it is still bound by specific constitutional limitations. So many do's and don'ts, in fact, that the legislature has had to submit more than 300 constitutional amendments to the voters since 1876. Every time the legislature tries to start any kind of a new... Uh, now, this is the Speaker of the House at the time, Gus Mutcher. ...program to change the structure of the educational system or change the structure uh, for building highways or anything else, we find that we run head-on into a constitutional provision. And we have to go back to the people with a host of amendments each time the legislature meets to try to to change these constitutional provisions that really should have been statutory in the first place. Frankly, I think that it works uh, very much against the public interest because I think citizens, after a while, get very tired of having these uh, issues submitted to them all the time, and they begin to wonder why the legislature can't legislate. And uh, people don't stop to go into the historical aspect of why these amendments must be submitted. Uh, and of course, they're all submitted in very legalistic language and people are highly suspicious, uh, particularly in these times, of anything uh, that is not uh, very clear to them uh, when it's presented to them. So it really is a very awkward situation. These limitations have also hampered Texas counties in the ability to serve their residents, according to Tom Bass, who was in state government before he became a county official. We need to have more authority in the Constitution to conduct an urban county government and react more rapidly to problems that arise, I would hope that uh, we would draft a constitution that would make the county fathers more responsible so that if a problem is not solved, then we can say the commissioner's court failed to act. At the present time, the commissioner's court can say, yes, we failed to act, but the legislature uh, did not give us the authority to, and the Constitution restricts us. If the Constitution gives the authority to the Commission, then at least the, the voting citizens have a, someone that they can point the finger to. It, it may not solve the problem, but at least I think it pinpoints responsibility a little more. Most Texans were farmers or ranchers when the present Constitution was adopted. Now a majority live in the cities. And the mayor of the state's largest city says the present constitution does not fit their needs. It's been my belief that the home rule principle should be extended to let cities actually have home rule. Uh, for example, the maximum tax rate is now set by state constitution. I think the people, the individual voters in each community should be able by charter to set the maximum tax rates with which their local governments could uh, operate. Uh, the designated areas where taxation is legal has been usurped by the state constitution. And it's my belief that the credit rating of the cities of Texas would be vastly improved if anything not specifically prohibited uh, could be open for consideration by the people of every community for uh, the rating of whatever tax is necessary to perform the functions that the people in that community feel is advisable and necessary. But it's not just in the field of taxation that the present Constitution affects the people of Texas. The inadequacies of the Constitution affect the, uh, the citizens of this state adversely in a number of ways. First of all, uh, it creates a very... Well, this is Lieutenant Governor 
uh, William Hobby Jr. at the time. He's still alive. He's like 88. He was the president of uh, the University of Houston system, like Rice University. Very uh, inefficient state government. We have uh, scores and scores of different state agencies without any central direction. Uh, it, it makes state government an unwieldy sort of institution as well as an efficient one with which a, a citizen has to deal. Where they see the judicial process operate is at the trial court level. And at this level, they find the process slowed down to the point where they sit for hours waiting to be called for jury service and then maybe are excused and they've lost a day from their business or from their work. Or they uh, see a sloppy process of trial and disposition of cases. And I would say that the process is not very conducive to uh, public respect for the judiciary. Well, it affects uh, all the people because uh, actually the, the legislature, the members of the legislature who uh, represent the people when the legislature is in session, they are guided and controlled by the provisions of the Constitution, which in turn makes the Constitution really the controlling factor over the lives of all the people through the actions of the legislators. There have been numerous attempts at revising the Constitution, beginning as far back as 1917 and continuing until today. So this time, the authors have tried a new approach. They're using a commission of private citizens, or actually it's, uh, it will be a commission of people who are very, very uh, well-versed and knowledgeable in government and governmental operations and constitutional law. And from this private citizen group of uh, people who really know what they're doing. We feel that we will get very good recommendations and very good uh, rewriting work done. That then will be submitted to the legislature. The legislature will go into session if the people approve the November proposition uh, in January of 1974 and will act on those recommendations from this commission of uh, experts or people who are very knowledgeable in the field. It's far superior to trying to have uh, uh, the legislature, uh, which is a part-time body, try to do the job themselves. The proposition for revising the Constitution will be on the November 7th ballot in the general election as amendment number four. Under the terms of the amendment on the ballot, the convention, which hopefully will sit in 1974, uh, will draft a, an entirely new Constitution. Uh, it is not compelled to do so. Uh, it can offer amendments to the existing articles, can offer a series of amendments. It can do uh, really anything it wants to in that respect. Uh, the only prohibition in the amendment, the only inhibition, I should say, being the uh, uh, restriction that the Bill of Rights should be retained unchanged, which certainly nobody would wish to tamper with anyway. There are serious doubts in the mind of some about the amendment for constitutional reform. These center around the questions of whether the legislature is the body to do it. Attorney Cooper Reagan is one who raises these issues. I'm not the one to say that, that uh, there shouldn't be any changes, but I think we ought to do it uh, piecemeal, so to speak, by revising instead of uh, uh, adopting a new uh, instrument. I, I feel that the, uh, there should be uh, a constitutional convention, and I feel that the, the uh, delegates of that convention uh, should either be uh, uh, selected by uh, a board consisting of uh, perhaps our uh, highest elective officers of the state government, uh, uh, or uh, perhaps by a, a vote of the uh, people of each county. Uh, or by the board of the people of each senatorial district or each congressional district. Uh, I don't think the uh, legislature, by and large, or uh, the legislators themselves are, are qualified uh, to rewrite the Constitution. On November 7th, you will be asked to decide if the Texas Constitution should be changed. It is the first time in 53 years that Texas voters have had that choice. Your decision may not be made under the same dramatic circumstances as those facing the citizens here at Washington on the Brazos in 1836, but the decision is the same. This time, you must choose the kind of government you want.
This time the decision is yours. So this film produced in the probably the summer, spring and summer of 19, 1972, after the uh, movement began in the 71 legislature where they adopted a resolution, proposed an amendment authorizing the appointment of a study commission. And they named the members of the legislature as delegates to a constitutional convention. Now they couldn't deal with the Bill of Rights. That was untouchable. Couldn't be changed or deleted. And in that election that he mentioned on November 7th, in 1972, this amendment passed by a margin of more than a half a million votes, 1.5 million votes in favor to 985,000 against. Uh, so says the text on page 60, bottom of page 67. So a six member committee composed of the governor, Lieutenant Governor, Speaker of the House, some of those guys you saw in the video, they selected 37 members or people to serve as a commission, a constitutional revision commission. And the commission prepared a draft constitution. They went around, had meetings all over the state, including Laredo. People gave their opinions, information at these public hearings. And they completed a draft on November 1st, 1973 and submitted it to the legislature. And the legislature meeting in January 1974, all 181 acted as a constitutional revision convention. Price Daniel Jr. was the convention chairman. Later he would be murdered and his wife would be charged, but she was found not guilty because of um, spousal abuse and it was made into a television movie. But the convention of 74 was hampered by a lack of political leadership. Briscoe, the governor, had a hands-off approach. Uh, governor Hobby really didn't provide, or Lieutenant Governor Hobby didn't provide too much needed political leadership. So there was a non-intervention course by these political leaders. And then issues like the right to work provision became a kind of a phantom non-issue. So there was loud and bitter name calling by the delegates and a lot of people publicly criticized what went on and they were all worried about their elections coming up in 1974. So by May, they couldn't get two thirds vote to obtain the necessary votes to send it to the voters. They were a few short. Now the revision proposed in 1975 represented the years of work by all these men and women and the voters in 250 counties rejected all eight proposals, except in Webb and Duvall and a couple others. They agreed to the eight amendments. So the constitutional revision failed. And I think also because the supporters just didn't explain their position. People were just mailed out prop copies of the proposed amendments. Briscoe, he didn't even support it. And he was a, he was a well-known figure, a popular governor. Now, since then, there have been more revision attempts in 1995. There was a senator from Lubbock who drafted a streamlined constitution that he kind of incorporated many of the concepts, 
But the Monford plan also called for a voter referendum every 30 years on the question of calling a constitutional revision convention. Tax changes, welfare reform, educational finance, that was a pressing need back then. And so they didn't really consider it in 1997 when the legislature met. 98, Senator Ratliff and Junell, a representative from San Angelo, they launched another attempt. In fact, some university students got involved and they prepared a complete rewrite. And that was introduced in the 76 legislature in 1999, but it did not also get serious consideration in committee. So it never got a floor vote in either legislative chamber. It would have cut the 80,000 words to 19,000 words. That's a significant change. Then Whitehall and a bipartisan team, uh, Whitehall was a retired instructor at a community college in Waco. He set out in 2010 to reorganize it. They just rearranged many of the existing provisions into a more logical sequence. But it didn't go anywhere. The legislature just has budget crisis or redistricting issues or school funding come up, so they really haven't taken on the task of uh, doing anything. So we still go through the piecemeal revisions. Okay. So let's go over finally a summary of the Texas Constitution, the basic sections of the Constitution. It's over 200 pages, complete, printed. It's available online. We don't have it in the book, but you can find it online very easily. Um, let's begin with the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is similar to the U.S. Constitution Bill of Rights. So it guarantees, of course, freedom of the press, speech, religion, assembly, petition, but it also adds the rights of the accused and convicted criminals and victims of crime and equal rights for women. Now, Article One also includes some philosophical observations that don't have any direct force of law. Eleven of the Article One sections, they protect people and property against arbitrary governmental action. Also, outlawry, imprisonment for debt, these things are also in there. Article one also forbids committing mentally ill with out of jury trial. Suspending the writ of habeas corpus is also cannot be done in any circumstances. Article two just says that there will be three branches of government. Article three talks about the state legislature, says it's gonna be bicameral, meaning there's gonna be a house and a Senate. But then in that article, there's, there's amendments that add sections on the Texas legislature has the authority to levy taxes to fund retirement systems for college teachers. That doesn't make any sense, but it's in that particular Article 3. Now, Article 4 deals with the executive branch. The governor is the chief executive, but he shares with four other popularly elected independent of the governor offices, lieutenant governor, attorney general, comptroller, public accounts, and the commissioner of the general land office. 
Article 5, that's the Judicial Department, and later in 1891, we adopted an amendment to separate the Supreme Court from the Court of Criminal Appeals. So we have two Supreme Courts, and then courts at the, le at the intermediate level, and then district courts, statutory county courts, Justice of the Peace Courts, and they're all elected in a partisan ballot. Article six, of course, defines suffrage, the right to vote. Now, since the Shelby case, Shelby County versus Holder, uh, we've been allowed to change the voting laws to require, let's say, um, implementation of the voter ID photo requirement. And that's been upheld. That means supported by the Supreme Court. Now, obviously, we can't uh, implement poll taxes. That's forbidden by the 24th Amendment. Now, then there's the local governments in Article 9 that created the local and county governments. It's very disorganized. Special districts were added in an amendment in 1904. And then there's many other articles that cover education, taxation, railroads, private corporations, general provisions. That's a long article. There used to be one sentence that was like uh, 10 paragraphs long, but it's been updated. Now it includes commas. So then it was handwritten out. and submitted to the voters. There's the signature page. So to sum up, um, let's take a look at this video. Let's review for a moment. driving force of the Constitutional Convention of 1875 was the desire and determination of the Texas Democrats to get rid of the Radical Constitution of 1869. It is important to note that the Republicans and the Democrats from this early time period are very different from the Republicans and Democrats of today. Edmund J. Davis was a very unpopular governor of Texas. He was only elected because those who had fought for or had taken an oath of loyalty to the Confederacy were prevented from voting. His policies were so unpopular that the Democrats and other groups were able to find enough eligible voters to defeat Davis in the election. Davis was replaced with Democrat Richard Koch. There wouldn't be another Republican governor of Texas until Bill Clements in the late 1970s. The Constitutional Convention began in Austin in 1875. The purpose was to replace the Constitution of 1869. What was created was a document that was restrictive of government power, that limited the authority of every branch of Texas government, where the Texas legislative branch was restricted by meeting every other year. They only have 140 days for each session. The executive branch was restricted by the splitting of the governor's powers into what we call the plural executive. And the plural executive includes the governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, comptroller, which doesn't exist anymore, the treasurer, and the land commissioner. The judicial system was limited by being split into two systems. A criminal. Oh, just a note on the previous list here. He got it reversed. The treasurer is no longer there, but there is a comptroller of public accounts. Land commissioner. The judicial system was limited by being split into two systems, a criminal system and a civil system. All One thing I should point out here is this was not done in 1876. It was actually done by an amendment in 1891. 
when they split the courts into two. Positions except the Secretary of State are elected by the people. The Texas Constitution was adopted by voters on February 15, 1876, and remains into effect to this day. The Constitution of the State of Texas has 17 articles. In this video, we will only focus on the Bill of Rights, the legislative branch, the judicial branch, and the amendment process. Article one of the Texas Constitution contains the Bill of Rights. Some of the rights granted to Texans include political power belonging to the people, equal rights and equality under the law, freedom of speech, press, and worship, right of trial by jury, and the right to keep and bear arms, among other rights. Article two deals with the separation of powers into a legislative, executive, and judicial branch. Article three creates the legislative branch. This article divides legislative power into two chambers, a house and a senate. It sets the qualifications to be a house member or senator, as well as the length of term of office. It lays out the process for legislative proceedings, as well as the rights and responsibilities of the House and Senate. Article four creates the executive department. It splits the executive into a plural executive. It also sets out age and residency requirements for the positions, as well as length of term of office. And it grants the governor veto power, as well as the power to call special sessions. Article five creates the judicial department. It splits the judicial system into a criminal system and a civil system. The top court for the criminal system is the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals and the top court for civil, for civil proceedings is the Texas Supreme Court. Judges, most judges in Texas are elected by popular vote. The last article of the Texas Constitution, Article 17, lays out the process for amending the Texas Constitution. First, there must be a proposed change in the Texas legislature. This change uh, must pass by a two thirds vote in both houses, must be voted on by the citizens of Texas. And as of 2019, there have been 500, 507 amendments added to the Texas Constitution. Okay, it's a good overview, I think. All righty. So, in conclusion, Texas in this federalist system, it is a dance. It's a constantly evolving dance. It's a changing dance. And sometimes it's a tense filled dance. Um, there's a lot of sometimes violent conflict, lawsuits constantly. Let's uh, look at it from this point of view. The dance by Fred Astaire and Sid Charisse.
suddenly all the pieces fitted together. I knew how the crime had been done. The high note on the trumpet that shattered the glass. <laughs> Now I knew who the killer was, but it didn't matter anymore. Killers have to die. Another page in the casebook of Ron Riley was finished. The city was asleep, the joints were closed, and the rats and hoods and the killers were in their holes. I felt good, but something was missing. She was bad. She was dangerous. I wouldn't trust her any farther than I did throw her. But she was my kind of woman. So which one is the federal government? Which one's the state government? Is Fred Astaire the man? Is he the state government? Is he Texas? Seduced by the United States government sometimes when they expand their power? Well, the U.S. Constitution, of course, they play a significant role in defining federal and state relations. The balance of power is, you know, it's constantly changing. Sometimes it's violent, like in the dance there. Sometimes the states go at each other. Sometimes the states, uh, one section or one region fights against the other, like in the Civil War. But it's a complicated system. There's a constant tension. But for Texas, the government derives its powers, most of its powers, from the Texas Constitution. So I hope this understanding of the Texas's constitutional history helps you understand the characteristics of our present day government. Uh, thank you for your kind attention.